If we're going to talk about gendered language, we may as well start at the start, or as close to the start as we can get, back in the old days. We've got here Mr. Charles de Roquefort. He wrote a book called Histoire naturelle et morale des pays Antilles d'Amérique, which translates to Natural and Moral History of the Antilles. This was back in 1658 and focused on the people of the Caribbean islands. One of the most relevant notations taken from this study to this particular subject being how he complained that women speak a different language to men, that they understand what men are saying but won't talk the same way. A lot of this came from stuff like colonisation, etc. But it was also a lot of whining about how women's vocabularies refused to quit for men's benefit. If we're carrying on with this theme of golden oldies, this is a bloke called Otto Jespersen. His theory came out in 1922 and is not so lovingly referred to in my notes as the sexist one. Basically, he said that women are naturally conservative, they're not funny, and they have very limited vocabulary, whilst men innovate language, coin new terms. Men are having a great time. This is Otto Jespersen, aka. Hopping forward a few years, we see a little less complaining and a little more understanding. Theorists started to look at the semantic space occupied by women and why they were put in that place. This is our buddy Deborah Cameron. Cameron came up with an idea in 1995 concerning the way women are taught to interact. This theory is called verbal hygiene theory. And while some of the people with the worst profanities I've ever known are women, it involves the idea that girls are taught from a young age to speak in a certain dainty, clean style. Alison Jewell says this is an attempt to impose order on the social world. And whilst this all sounds very convoluted and complex, when stripped down, all that it means is that we teach our little girls to speak like proper ladies. This doesn't just apply to women though, this concept is pretty equal on both sides. We teach boys to speak in a certain way too. Another theorist, Judith Butler, came up with a similar concept but called it gender performativity. Once again, pretty complex sounding, but boils down to the idea that we're taught that people of our gender behave and speak in a certain way. So we speak as we think they should according to these values. When applied to the real world, this can be seen in the shock on people's faces when women speak explicitly about taboo subjects, whilst the same topic can be covered easily by men, or how if a man speaks in a typically feminine way, he's condemned as being camp, even gay. Cameron, in fact, covered this idea with Don Kulik in their book Language and Sexuality. You just can't stop old Debbie, she's everywhere. She was back at it again with an idea about semantic derogation. She was actually the editor of Muriel Schultz's 1990 book about that very topic, focusing on how words around women and their behaviours pick up negative connotations over time through semantic derogation. This could be because language is intrinsically biased against women. That's what Dale Spender thought anyway. In this book, Man Made Language, he talks about how language is geared towards men. It puts them as the standard and women as the secondary. Just like Julia Stanley's idea of marked terms and lexical asymmetry, we set men as the standard by calling them doctors, and women as the secretary by using affix lady to make it lady doctors, and suffix et to minimise major to majorette. Whilst a major is someone who's in charge, who knows what they're doing, a majorette is a lady who twirls sticks. But majorettes are elegant crowd pleasers. That's what women are supposed to be, right? Here we have a nice woman called Deborah Tannen. She said that women are gentle, cooperative, Look at this picture though, it needs an addition. Come on, how perfect was that? Anyway, she said that they have different purposes in their talk than men do. Men want status, women want support. Men want independence, women want intimacy. Advice versus understanding, information versus feelings, orders versus proposals, and finally, conflict versus compromise. Women speak for totally different reasons than men do. Pilkington, 1992, agreed with this, saying women talk for collaboration but men pause and disagree and insult each other. Something Cooper, 1991, said they do for solidarity. Just balance, guys. Furthermore, according to Robin Lackoff, 1975, women certainly are elegant, delicate, pathetic, weak. Wow, Robin. The thing is that Crosby and Nyquist, 1977, actually kind of proved Lackoff correct. They looked at three different settings for the use of language fe features identified by Lakoff. A lab, an information booth in Boston, and interactions between police and civilians in a station. They found that females consistently use Lakoff's features the most, and these features were least present when a male civilian spoke to a male booth worker. Some of the features of women's language Lakoff called out as being weak and deficient are things like apologies, backed by Sloan Crosley 2015, politeness, hedging, and tag questions. 
tag questions open up a whole new realm of gendered language. It wasn't only Lakoff, but Pamela Fishman who said that women use more tags. Fishman putting it down to a concept called shit work. Women must do the shit work in a mixed gender conversation, which means doing everything they can to keep it going, because men just won't keep a conversation going. It's all pauses and minimal responses from them. Paradoxically, there was a duo in 1975 called Dubois and Crouch, who said it was all a lie. Men actually use more tag questions. My memory peg for this is Blanche Dubois from Streetcar Named Desire, how she lives in a constant state of denial and deception. And apparently, so do we if we believe that women use more tags. Okay, so this revelation wasn't met with a totally warm reception. Many people criticising them because they didn't look at the type of tags used. Something that Janet Holmes actually did. She found that women used mostly effective and facilitative tags, whereas men, while still using mostly the same, used more modal tags overall than women. Basically, this means that women use tags to support an interaction or partner, but men are more likely to use them to demand information. Women use them selflessly, and men selfishly. In fact, a lot of studies have said that men are generally more selfish in their language use. For example, in terms of interruptions and floor holding, Leek Pellegrini found that in a mixed expertise conversations of 70 stranger dyads, men consistently held the floor for longer and interrupted more, even if they were the non-experts in a duo. My memory peg for this is Pellegrini, because it reminds me of San Pellegrino with a drink, and I imagine two people sitting together having a conversation over a glass of San Pellegrino. I know it's dumb, but it helps me, okay? Anyway, another study for this was Zimmerman and West, who found that on average, men interrupt a shocking 96% more than women. But this was countered by a researcher called Beattie. Beattie criticised them, saying they didn't look at the kind of interruptions. They could have been cooperative, not competitive. They could have been back -channeling. They could have been supportive, and yet here we are ripping men apart for being so dominating in the conversation. You know what else we shred men for? Talking badly. Labov, 1966, coined the terms overt and covert prestige, claiming that women seek the former and men the latter. Overt prestige comes from speaking in a manner linked to explicit power, like using standard forms and generally being closer to RP. Covert, however, comes from fitting into your surroundings. For example, not speaking the Queen's English when in a footy pub in South London. You might get shanked if you do that. To be fair though, both Trodgill and Cheshire, 1974 and 1982 respectively, supported these claims, finding boys using more non-standard forms such as clipping, and also their language is largely shaped by vernacular culture rather than girls, which is more a personal development. But what if I were to just say, disregard all of that, that all the differences we recognise are just in our head? There's actually more to it. Like Tune Van Dyck, Obar and Atkins said that language is actually completely context dependent. Whilst Dick says it's based on being appropriate to your knowledge of your audience, Obar and Atkins say that language is more an expression of power in situation, as found in their observations in which they found lack of features of women's language not present in all women, nor present only in women. How about Janet Hyde, 2005? Her meta-analysis found more similarities in language in either gender than she did differences, suggesting that maybe language variation is once again down to context rather than gender. But wait, there's more. Deborah Cameron is back at it again, saying that society makes us see differences that just aren't there. And Judith Butler says we only act different because that's what we're taught. Gender performativity, you know? We act according to what society says we should do as our gender. Lastly, we've got Mary Tabble like a less cool version of Bella Tabletoff off Supernatural. She's not only behind the concept of synthetic sisterhood, but also says that gender is totally a social construct, that there's different types of femininity, different types of masculinity, and we all just act because that's how we're socialised to act. So what do you believe? Is gender a social construct and how we act is according to our socialisation? Or do we really speak differently because of our genitalia? That was a weird, weird sentence to say. Who knows? Good luck in your exams, fam.